Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from AstraZeneca. Hello, my name is Chaba Kavesdi. I am the Fred Hatch Professor of Medicine and Nephrology at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis, Tennessee. Welcome to this program titled Potassium and Acid Regulation, Clinical Implications for Clinicians. Joining me today are two distinguished faculty, Biff Palmer, who is Professor of Internal Medicine at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas, and Donald Wesson, who is also Professor of Medicine at Texas A&M College of Medicine in Dallas, Texas. So let's uh, get into it. So I would start with a uh, case presentation to get us started. Uh, we have a 54-year-old male patient who is seen for follow-up in your clinic for diabetic chronic kidney disease. He is asymptomatic on presentation, and his past medical history includes type 2 diabetes mellitus for 15 years, diabetic retinopathy and neuropathy, hypertension for 20 years, and gastroesophageal reflux disease. His medications include metformin, 500 milligrams, dapagliflozin, 10 milligrams, lisinopril, 40 milligrams, and amlodipine, 5 milligrams, as well as sucrophate. So our patient's social history is negative. His diet consists of a salt-restricted diet. On physical exam, he has a blood pressure of 128 over 74 millimeter mercury, a body mass index of 28 kilograms per square meter, and is otherwise unremarkable. Pertinent abnormal labs include a serum creatinine of 2.1 milligrams per deciliter, corresponding to an estimated GFR of 35 ml per minute, a serum potassium of 5.6 milliequivalents per liter, a serum bicarbonate of 20 milliequivalents per liter with an anion gap of eight, a hemoglobin A1C of 6.9%, and a urinalysis showing trace protein as well as an albumin creatinine ratio of 103 milligrams per gram. So your assessment is that you have a patient with diabetic chronic kidney disease with well-controlled risk factors. However, the patient presents with both hyperkalemia and the metabolic acidosis with normal anion gap, both of uh, which can occur fairly commonly in uh, our patient population. Uh, so let's, let's start uh, the, the discussion. Uh, let's start uh, uh, with the metabolic acidosis part. Uh, Don, uh, could you tell us about uh, how common this is in chronic kidney disease, why it occurs, and what its consequences are? Well, thanks, Chaba. Uh, metabolic acidosis in chronic kidney disease is actually pretty common. Um, the lower the GFR, that is the more advanced the stage, the more likely one is to have metabolic acidosis. The EGFR of our patient of 35 places him in the 3B category of, of uh, CKD stages. And they run about 10 to 15% of, of those individuals on average would have metabolic acidosis. And you recognize that because metabolic acidosis is due in large part to uh, a reduction in the kidney's ability to excrete acid, it is largely dependent on how low the GFR is, the frequency with which one is going to see metabolic acidosis. And also uh, some of our uh, data suggests that the greater the acid intake in our diet, increases the risk that, that an individual would, would have uh, metabolic acidosis. So it is uh, fairly common. And the EGFR that we have of 35 is above 30. That's important because um, our, our primary care guidelines say that they such patients are referred for care by nephrologists, Biff and I, when the GFR is less than 30. So this is a patient that could very easily be and very capably taken mm -hmm. care of by our primary care colleagues. And so these are patients that don't necessarily have to be taken 
care of by us nephrologists. But Biff and I would prefer that we would have some input into their care to make some recommendations as to what is to be done uh, for such patients. Lastly, I'll say with his uh, serum bicarbonate being less than 22, he fits current guidelines for treatment of his metabolic acidosis. And we're gonna talk about ways by which- Just a quick question before we go on to uh, consequences. Is it possible to have uh, acidosis or acidemia without the change in bicarbonate uh, in patients with more, uh, with less advanced uh, chronic kidney disease? It is, it is possible, but, but not likely. And we, uh, we acid-based folks, we, we, we often fuss over this in that the, the bicarbonate can be low because of metabolic acidosis, but it can also be low because of respiratory alkalosis. But the studies would suggest that in an individual whose GFR is this low, and with the history that we've just talked about, a low bicarbonate is overwhelmingly like, more likely to be due to metabolic acidosis than it is to be due to respiratory alkalosis. That's right. So. Um... What are the consequences of metabolic acidosis? Is it just a number uh, that we shouldn't worry about or is it something that can affect uh, you know, a patient's future health? Well, unfortunately, Chava is not just a number and we've recognized in the recent studies really over the last 20 years. First of all, patients with metabolic acidosis and CKD have a higher risk of mortality than the individuals who do not uh, have metabolic acidosis. But in general, we, we clinicians think about metabolic acidosis as causing problems with three organ systems, bones, muscles, and kidneys. And we've, we've shown very convincingly treating metabolic acidosis improves bone health. It also improves muscle health. And increasing data, some of which is from our lab and from other labs, have shown that it also uh, improves uh, kidney health. So there are many reasons to treat metabolic acidosis. It's not just a number. And as I said, the current guidelines say that patients should be treated when their metabolic acidosis is severe enough to reduce their serum bicarbonate less than 22 milliequivalents per liter. Yeah, that's that's extremely interesting, and I, I guess the bone and the mus muscle is well known, but the damage to the kidneys is uh, is strange in a way. I mean, physicians uh, know that lower kidney function causes metabolic acidosis, but how does metabolic acidosis damage the kidneys? Well, it has to do with, uh, in large part, how the the kidney excretes acid when it is challenged uh, with acid. So we recognize, first of all, that the kidney excretes acid in the urine in the form of buffers, not in free acid. And the main buffer that it excretes is ammonium. And ammonium uh, excretion gives us the benefit of taking acid out of the body. But studies show, uh, done more than 30 years ago shows that high ammonium levels in the kidney parenchyma stimulates complement and uh, engenders inflammation, including uh, fibrosis, most notably in the interstitium of the kidney. And so this high ammonium content sustained over months, probably years to decades, causes uh, kidney injury. First point. Second point, uh, another way by which the kidney is able to get rid of this acid is by raising the level of certain agents in the kidney, most notably endothelin, angiotensin II, and aldosterone. These substances help stimulate the tubules in the kidney to get rid of that acid. And of course, that's that short-term benefit. But unfortunately, each one of these three substances are also associated with increased inflammation and fibrosis in the interstitium of the kidney. And so over the course of a sustained acid challenge that goes from years to decades, that can cause slow inflammation with fibrosis in the kidney and a gradual reduction of, of, of kidney function with time. And so it is both uh, due to the mechanisms by which the, the kidney gets rid of acid 
and the fact that we are constantly challenging ourselves with our diets, particularly the Western type diets that are highly acid producing, and they challenge the kidney to get rid of that acid. So it sounds like another one of those adaptive systems gone maladaptive if uh, maintained for a long time, like many of the things that happen with chronic kidney disease, right? Absolutely, I like that. It, it becomes uh, a maladaptive uh, uh, system after a while with it being initially adaptive to allow us to be able to get rid of that acid that we're ingesting uh, in our diets. Yeah, so th this is uh, fascinating stuff. So let's turn our attention to the hyperkalemia component because that's also something that we see in a fair number of our patients. Uh, Biff, can you introduce uh, to us uh, how, how common this is in CKD and particularly to this case, uh, can it be linked to uh, the acidosis that the patient has? Yeah, thank you, Saba. The, I mean, I think uh, as everybody is aware, if you have normal kidneys, uh, it's actually quite unusual to get hyperkalemic, but where we start to see hyperkalemia is when there's damage to the kidney, chronic kidney disease patients. And when hyperkalemia starts to develop, we oftentimes see it as in this individual that you presented to us, a coexistent normal gap acidosis. And there's some reason to believe that at least in some circumstances, if not, if not most, that the hyperkalemia could be actually playing a direct contributory role. Uh, you know, with regards to ammonia genesis, uh, it turns out that ammonia that is used for buffering in the kidney is virtually all produced in the proximal tubule and the things that uh, lead to its augmentation or production is low blood potassium and a low blood pH. Low blood potassium actually leads to acidification within the cell, so it's somewhat analogous to the low blood pH. And it turns out that the enzymes involved in the formation of ammonia, as well as the uptake of ammonia precursors being the amino acid glutamine, those are all upregulated in the setting of a uh, low blood pH. Uh, the relationship to hyperkalemia though has, uh, is maybe just the opposite. There's actually reason to believe that when the blood potassium is elevated, the cells in the proximal tubule actually become somewhat alkalinized and that then shuts off ammonia genesis. In addition, with hyperkalemia, more potassium has now accumulated in the interstitial compartments of the kidney that may interfere in the uh, transfer of ammonia through the tubules. And lastly, hyperkalemia may actually interfere in some of the movement of, of ammonium to uh, into the tubular lumen and prevent it from adequately serving as a buffer. So there seems to be a, a pathophysiologic link between high blood potassium and interfering in this buffering capacity of ammonia. So in other words, as the potassium goes up, you are then become more at risk for developing acidosis. And there's actually data to suggest that correcting the hyperkalemia, even in the absence of giving somebody bicarbonate, that that actually has a favorable effect on uh, improving the plasma bicarbonate concentration. Let's go back to that, uh, you know, when we get into the treatment discussion, because that's a fascinating uh, thought. But before we get there, um, is there any data to suggest that uh, hyperkalemia and uh, metabolic acidosis go hand in hand? How often uh, is this occurring? Yeah, so th there's at least uh, retrospective data uh, in which people have taken people with hyperkalemia of varying severity, and then actually looked at the uh, plasma bicarbonate concentration and at least in uh, one abstract that was presented recently by the Nas at the National Kidney Foundation meetings, uh, people who had plasma potassiums greater than five, maybe uh, up to 30 to 40% of those individuals had a bicarbonate concentration less than 22. And in about 10% of individuals, the plasma bicarbonate concentration was less than 18. So again, at least suggesting an association between those who have high blood potassiums and development of metabolic acidosis. And that becomes a concern, just like Don was saying, because we, there's a lot of rodent model data and now clinical data to suggest that uh, this uh, chronic acidosis may be a contributor to the progression of the chronic kidney disease. 
Yes, very, very interesting. Uh, so let's uh, turn our attention to, uh, to therapy then. Uh, um, you know, going back to uh, metabolic acidosis, uh, Dom, what are our options and what can we expect from the treatment of metabolic acidosis? Could, could it protect uh, um, health outcomes uh, uh, or, or is it just correcting the number? Uh, that's a great question, uh, Chaba. And it's not just correcting the number. So I mentioned before that uh, metabolic acidosis is not only harmful to those three organs, bones, muscles, and kidneys, uh, it also is associated with worse uh, mortality. And so we have one large scale study, uh, Diorio and Al have shown that in about 700 patients that they treated with sodium bicarbonate, those who got sodium bicarbonate had a lower mortality. So it suggests that, that, uh, that the basic thing that we wanna do for our patients, that is keep them alive longer that we may well be able to serve that, that goal by treating uh, their metabolic acidosis. Great data on making bones better, great data on making muscles better, and increasing data that says that it slows the progression of, of, of chronic kidney disease. So yes, treatment does help. It's not just the number. Treating metabolic acidosis does help in those three areas. And we've got uh, two primary mechanistic ways by which we can do that. We can lower the additional acid load to the body. As I mentioned, the more acid that we take in, the, uh, the, the more likely we are to have metabolic acidosis, and that's typically done by diet. We reduce the amount of acid-producing components like animal products and refined grains. We increase the amount of base-producing products like fruits and vegetables. Now, the challenge with the latter in this individual who has hyperkalemia is that fruits and vegetables have a high potassium content. So that wouldn't be my first choice in this individual. However, the, uh, the other way that we can treat uh, metabolic acidosis is to neutralize the acid that is on board. And so we give alkali typically in the form of sodium bicarbonate or less commonly uh, sodium citrate. So we've got those two strategies by which to treat them. But Biff has, has, has uh, pointed out a potential additional way we might consider in this individual who has hyperkalemia, which is associated with decreased ammoniogenesis. Remember we said the ammonia excretion is very important to allow us to excrete acid. If we were able to lower the serum potassium, that may well allow the kidney to better excrete the uh, ammonium and, and potentially make the metabolic acidosis in, uh, better in that way. So that's one thing that I would at least consider uh, addressing in this patient. So, so uh, very interesting, Biff. So what do you think about that? Uh, are there any suggestions from studies or data that uh, maybe fixing uh, uh, potassium in this patient uh, could uh, uh, kill two birds with one stone? Yeah, th there are. And let me just point out one other aspect of the case that you presented. You know, he was on a angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. And one could argue that maybe that was playing a role in the development of the high blood potassium. And why not just either cut down the dose or even discontinue mm -hmm. the ACE inhibitor? But, you know, that really brings up a whole catch-22 because this type of individual with chronic kidney disease probably is deriving a lot of kidney protective effect, mm -hmm. perhaps cardiovascular protective effect from that drug. And so to discontinue it or even use less than maximal doses is uh, not optimal. And so if you had a way to be able to control the potassium and still allow that drug to be utilized at recommended doses would certainly be optimal for his long-term benefit. Uh, in that regard, there are data now where one can use on a long-term basis uh, drugs that actually bind potassium in the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, these these uh, drugs have, in addition to being shown to control the blood potassium, despite ongoing use of drugs that target the renin angiotensin system, in controlling the potassium, they have shown that there is an increase in the plasma bicarbonate concentration. And, you get, mm -hmm. and it goes back to this idea that perhaps uh, the high blood potassium in and of itself is contributing to this reduction 
in uh, ammonia availability and it interfering in bicarbonate regeneration. And as you lower the blood potassium, you restore the ammonia genesis. And that's reflected at least in these studies by an increase in the uh, plasma bicarbonate concentration. So again, uh, I think it, it's an encouraging finding and something that may be of utility in these types of individuals. Yes, I, I guess, um, you know, I'm, I'm familiar uh, with a study with the uh, sodium zirconium cyclosilicate, uh, where uh, administration of this drug led to uh, increased uh, bicarbonate while uh, decreasing potassium. But in, in the case of this drug, there is also this mechanism of uh, uh, binding acid precursors in the intestines. Uh, is, isn't that right? Yeah, so the zirconium cyclosilicate, it's an interesting structure. It's a crystalline structure that uh, was designed in such a way to bind potassium. And the only other thing that it tends to bind to is ammonium, NH4+, which is actually not surprising because both of those molecules have very similar ionic radii. And so, yes, it has been argued that some of the tendency for that drug to raise the plasma bicarbonate may simply be because you're binding ammonium in the GI tract. But again, I would, I would just make the observation that it's also possible that controlling the potassium is also restoring ammonia genesis. Uh, so either way, uh, the, the observation is the same, and that is the plasma bicarbonate does seem to go up. Yes, so, so very interesting. So let's say that, that uh, in your practice, you opt to use a potassium binding like, like sodium zirconium cyclosilicate. Uh, um, now I have to bring this up because uh, this is a relatively novel binder and it may be uh, more expensive or patients may have less access uh, to the medication. How do you handle uh, this problem? What's the role of uh, you know, other team members uh, in, in your practice uh, uh, to address these kinds of problems? And I, I open this up to both of you, uh, you know, just talk about your experience. Well, I will say that um... One of the challenges of treating uh, uh, metabolic acidosis has to do with the agents that we use. So let's, the most common one that we use, sodium bicarbonate, works well, but has to be given at relatively high doses in order to get the, the serum bicarbonate up above the 22 milliequivalents per liter uh, uh, level that, that we shoot for. That means a lot of sodium bicarbonate. That means a lot of sodium. And the patients who are most likely to get metabolic acidosis are folks who have low GFRs. The folks who have low GFRs tend to be sodium sensitive. So we have to be careful regarding the amount of sodium bicarbonate that we give. And one way by which we can uh, modulate that is that if we have them on a diet that reduces the amount of acid that they take in, then that can spare the amount of sodium carbonate that is needed to achieve the target levels of, 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 of serum bicarbonate uh, that we're shooting for. Zirconium is a great drug that can potentially as you said, Chaba killed two birds with one stone, that is to lower the potassium and raise bicarbonate. We have to remember though that the, the, the increases in bicarbonate that Biff talked about, one or two milliequivalents per liter, which is nothing to sneeze at, anything that we, any amount we can get up, we like, but it's not a dramatic increase, but it comes at the cost of an increased sodium load. So those are things that we have to balance. We have to make sure that the patient has sufficient GFR are enough naturetic agents on board to allow them to be able to handle the, uh, the additional sodium load. So I guess uh, um, you would involve your dietitian potentially because this sounds like a pretty complex uh, landscape to navigate with diet and medications and sodium load and all that uh, to be taken into account, not to mention the protein intake and potential protein restriction that would be needed. Yeah, how about the, the access to the medication? Uh, do you have experience with, let's say, working with a pharmacist or somebody who, who can help the patient with those issues? Absolutely. Uh, you know, it is a team approach. Uh, the, for example, I know the, uh, the, there are support programs uh, that are offered by the companies that make these potassium binding drugs that, that can be utilized in some instances. And so to rely on the pharmacist to help uh, navigate through that landscape as well is certainly something that needs to be done. I think, Don, you're bringing up a, a great issue about the role of the dietitian. You know, one of the unexplored areas, I think, that people are very interested in is 
could one allow a more liberal use of fruits and vegetables as a way to offer a bicarbonate load? And yes, there is the risk of worsening the hyperkalemia, but there, would there be a role for potassium binding drugs to help control the potassium and yet allow the liberalization with a heart healthy type of diet? I think this is kind of an unexplored area that a lot of people are, are now interested in. Yeah, Viv, I love that you're bringing that up. And Chava, it just emphasized the point that you brought up, the importance of a team approach. You know, we nephrologists, we've been practicing team medicine for a long time. Um, but it is now coming to fore as being even more important. So we docs make recommendations. Uh, our pharmacy colleagues are helpful in uh, not only providing access to the drugs that Biff mentioned, but also making recommendations as to which one may be best for our given patient, given the fact that, for instance, with the potassium binders, there are a number of them on, on the market. And we in our practice and in my laboratory in particular, really lean on our dietitians uh, to help us in terms of, not just in terms of their overall nutritional status, but as we've indicated, the dietitians can have a very important role in management of the metabolic acidosis by prescribing uh, a diet that is low, lower in acid producing components and higher in base producing components. So it, it truly is a team effort. Uh, that's uh, truly fascinating. Uh, and uh, uh, Biff and Don, uh, thank you for this great, great discussion. And uh, uh, thank you for participating in this uh, activity. Uh, please continue on to answer the questions that follow and complete the evaluation.